Welcome back. Um, we are about to enter our final session for this morning. We will then break for lunch um, and regroup after lunch. So the next session is a general Q&A panel discussion. And I will read the bios of our um, panelists because that will help direct some of your questions. Um, we've tried to give a broad representation for this um, session, so hopefully you'll be able to target the right person with your inquiries. So I will read their bios um, while they get mic'd up. First, I'd like to start with Dr. David Rye. He is the professor of neurology at Emory University, board certified in neurology and sleep medicine. Dr. Rye has received the American Academy of Neurology's Sleep Science Award and the Sleep Research Society's Outstanding Scientific Achievement Award for the discovery of the genetic contributions of restless leg syndrome. In June of 2019, Dr. Rye received the Hypersomnia Foundation's, <coughs> excuse me, the Hypersomnia Foundation's first impact award for his pivotal work in the area in researching and treating idiopathic hypersomnia and is support of our organization's efforts to provide education on IH and related disorders to patients, healthcare providers, and through PBS's Your Fantastic Mind series, the general public. He has also received Narcolep Narcolepsy Network's Researcher of the Year Award, which recognizes the Emory's team more recent contribution to our understanding of the origins and treatments for hypersomnia. He and the Emory team are making new discoveries into the origins and treatments of hypersomnia that are transforming the way medicine is actually practiced. Dr. Rai is a former founding chair of HFS, our organization, Hypersomnia Foundation Scientific Advisory Board. Diana Kimmel will be joining our panel as well. Diana has been supporting the work on of um, the Hypersomnia Foundation since its inception in 2013. She's attended conferences, online events, and since 2019 is a member of the Hypersomnia Foundation's PAC committee, that is our Patient Advocacy and Advisory Council. Diana has participated in given presentations to people with idiopathic hypersomnia and their supporters at HF conferences and at conferences and events for medical and sleep, med um, sleep medicine professionals. After being diagnosed in 2011 with idiopathic hypersomnia, Diana focused on creating a supportive community for people living with IH and their loved ones. Her passion for community outreach led her to start holding monthly support group meetings in Atlanta, which have been meeting regularly since 2014. She also co-founded the Hypersomnia Alliance and co-facilitates IH support retreats known as snooze cruises. <laughs> you want to come up? Thank you. Great. Okay, I'm going to introduce Michael next. Michael Spracci is our board member and he formally in, um, joined the board of directors in October of 2021. After volunteering for several years, especially helping with technology during in-person and virtual conferences and webinars, he is passionate about our work as his wife has IH. Michael holds a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy from Clemson University and has a background in product, product and project management. He specializes in leading teams of developers, brings his wealth of skills and experience to the Hypersomnia Foundation. Thank you, Michael. Um, <laughs> we couldn't honestly have done this conference without him or, or Diana. Please let me introduce to you Victoria Kirby York. She is the Director of Public Policy and Programs at the National Black Justice Coalition, a civil rights organization dedicated to the empowerment of black, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer plus and same gender loving people, including people living with HIV AIDS. She is a highly sought after public speaker, board member and recognized and awarded leader and is currently serving as a board member of the Ballot Initiative Strategy Center, a member of the Presidential Advisory Council for Search and Common Ground, and is a patient advocate with the Hypersomnia Foundation's Diversity and Inclusion Council 
and the fibromyalgia network. Thank you, for Vicky, for joining us. Okay, so I hope you are ready with your questions. Um, who wants to start? <laughs> All right, thank you. So you can say your name and ask your question and to whom it's directed. Hi, my name's Nikki Webb. This is for Dr. Rye. Um, I attended the first Hypersomnia Foundation um, uh, conference and want to thank you and your team for all of their hard work. Wondering where we are in the hunt for the sleepy juice. Okay. I've spoken about um, at the last couple of meetings and we're kind of stuck mostly on resourcing right now. Um, I've been talking to people um, to move forward. We have a candidate molecule that looks very promising. It probably explains 15 or 20% of cases. So it's not any single, I think the main point to take is that it is um, not a single cause, um, that hypersomnia is a spectrum and it's heterogeneous. Like um, I've shown pictures before of a different um, apples and we can all agree hypersomnia, you know, they're all hypersomnic, but they're unique. And so maybe 15 or 20% are explained by this. One, one of the issues separate from um, funding to move forward, and there's reasons for that is, um, or that doesn't exist, but we're hard to get. But the other, um, ah, see, I've got brain fog right now. <laughs> we understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> or ADD. Um, what's the, oh, the other reason is because it turns out this peptide is probably regulated with, um, by um, monoamines, psychostimulants. And many of the people that we did spinal taps on initially, and we, we have written down were on stimulants, and they have elevated levels of this. And and some people have elevated levels who we know aren't on stimulants. So it's hard to know how to handle the ones that were medicated at the time because it could be a false positive, so to speak. So that, that's been a bit of an issue. So that's where we're at. Yeah, not, not a lot to say in 10 years is pretty bad, huh? All right, thank you. Did you want to say? Yeah. Um, I was curious for those of us that did have the um, spinal taps done at Emory, did you guys check for the hypocretin with that as well? Oh yeah, all okay. of them. So I was, okay, I was curious about this. And then I just wanted to say, can you check your patient portal, please? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> therein, therein lies one of the problems. <laughs> yeah. Um, there in, we've switched at Emory to Epic My Chart, and it's, it's, ah. uh, we actually met with the new VP of Health Affairs <laughs> at 7.30 in the morning yesterday as faculty, complaining about one message becomes 12 about the same patient, about the same topic, because it's, as I said, what's wrong? The system's great, because it has lots of degrees of freedom, but it has too many degrees of freedom. <laughs> So it's hard to dig the, the, the truth from the... Mm. I have an online question, which I think um, Diana or Michael or Victoria could answer. So it's being a mom, a student, the household manager, and a person with IH has me stretched thin even though I'm overweight. How can I manage my IH and my busy day to make sure that I can exercise? Can you repeat the last two yeah, words? Right. How can I arrange my busy day to make sure that I can exercise? Exercise. Okay. Oof. Thank you. You want to start? You have them? Sure. The first thought that came to me um, that I find useful are various um, apps on my phone or also smartwatch. Um, otherwise, I don't remember to take a pause in my day. You know, as a mother, as someone who works a job that requires me to travel across the country, um, and also being a wife, <laughs> you know, your, your significant other often demands of your time as well, right? Um, sometimes there's so much movement, so much that we're in the midst of doing, that just having 
um, whether it's a vibration or the most annoying song or sound <laughs> that you can have uh, come up on your phone or an app that's more structured um, that has different ways that um, it can help uh, not only encourage you to pause, but what else to do after the pause, right? So there are some different apps. I'm an Android user. I know others are you know, iPhone or Windows users. But there are various apps um, that uh, will help force the pause, again, whether from different, whatever works best for you. Um, the Scuttlebutt song from uh, <laughs> The New Little Mermaid is my new favorite annoying thing to get me to stop. <laughs> my daughter loves it, which means it's going to be another let's talk about Bruno moment where I'm just like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that, that's helpful for me. Um, but the apps will give you, you know, some sample exercises and stretches to do. Um, if you actually have um, a tools, maybe at your desk or somewhere in your house uh, for folks who like to do, uh, you know, dumbbells. I have a stationary bicycle because, you know, I get really nervous about riding my bike outside. If I have a spell, you know, n not the kind of ideal scenario. So I have a trainer that turns my normal outdoor bike into a stationary bicycle. Um, so you get a kind of a two for one. And when I get that ping, I'm like, okay, guys, I got to go get my exercise on. You want me to be around for a while, right? So go down yeah. to the basement, hop on that thing for as long as, you know, I have the time or ability to do, even if it's just five minutes. Um, and so, and that's something that's been helpful for me, leveraging technology and, you know, using a little bit of reverse mommy guilt. And mm -hmm. to expand on that a little bit, I would also say, like, as the, as the supporter in, in my, me and my wife's relationship, it's also really important to be fair to yourself and also to like supporters out there, make sure that you're helping with tasks and household chores and make sure that you're dividing up labor equally for each other's capacity because your loved one with IH is gonna have less capacity than you do, which means that you need to pick up more. So it's really important to have a good equal balance of who's doing household stuff so that you can have extra room because IH is gonna affect you differently than someone without IH. Yeah, for me, lists are important and I have my have to do list, my I would, I'd like to do list, and my dream to do list. And sometimes my have to do list doesn't get totally checked off. But for me, I would put a walk in there, exercise, and it is that looking at it each day, even if I just force myself to walk around the house, that helps. I would add that uh, having a little experience, I won't go through the details of um, uh, the supporters, you know, um, don't be lazy or d d impact, you know, sort of intervene, and even though you don't want to go for a walk or something, and you can see your partner or loved one maybe sinking a little bit, make the extra effort to sort of say, okay, I'm in a better place to ask yeah. and move them to, to get going and yeah. do something than they are, so yeah. go yeah. for a walk. Yeah, oh, right? hey, you mentioned take, you, mentioned take you your, wanted to go take for your a walk. loved one you still and want to go. go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. there are two other genres of apps too. That, if I'm honest, some sometimes are even better than the exercise ones, and those are affirmation apps that like send little notifications for folks who like. I forget to go into the app, but the notification comes down that's like, "You are worth it," or like, "You can do it." Whatever you're trying to. Like, okay, I know you're probably sending this to everyone, but it feels like the, the universe sent this message to me in this moment. <laughs> and whatever the thing is that I'm feeling like I'm not going to do, I just got that like, yes, I can do it. And the other is, um, oh, look, brain fog. It just lost, lost that quick. If I remember it, I'll bring it up. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? We do have quite a few online, but okay. Um, well, um, it's running over there. Actually, there is a question that speaks to, have any of you got um, experience in using like an Apple Watch overnight and recording sleep data? And if so, how, how do you make that work for, for your IH? What advantages are there for you to track your data at night? I use a Samsung watch, um, but I imagine Apple and the Fitbits work the same. 
for me, it gave me data that I don't know if it was recorded in my sleep studies or not, and I was just never told, but it highlighted the fact that I was not ever receiving restorative sleep, like literally like zero minutes in deep sleep. And that was, that led me down my own path of Googling, right? <laughs> of like, ooh, like, you know, connections between hypersomnia, you know, lack of restorative sleep, and, you know, the connections around deep sleep. You know, what are the ways that we can try to trick our brain into like not skipping that and going right back to start over the sleep cycle instead of going through the full thing? Um, and it helped me to have better questions to ask my neurologist and, and sleep doctor um, as a patient versus just coming and having the forced like new sleep test done or the like, let's talk about medication. I could actually talk about other things that I could do to help expand it because now I know that this is an issue that I, I need to figure out how to tackle. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. It also highlighted for me, which was interesting because I received a secondary diagnosis of very mild sleep apnea after I gained uh, weight after pregnancy. And um, my doctor was like, yeah, exercise, lose 15 pounds. It might go away, we'll redo another test. But <laughs> y'all know <laughs> these doctors and exercise. We all have gotten that oh, yeah. note. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh my goodness. Whew, that's a whole topic. But the the what the watch showed me was you know different from even the CPAP machine. Like it highlighted not that I was having these um, interrupted. Um, like sleep throughout each hour, but in the middle of the night, it was like almost every night around the same time, like 4 a.m. ish, which is, um, I have so many questions about Zywave, and anyway, because of the whole stop in the middle of the night piece. But um, every night in the middle of the night was when I would stop breathing. So it wasn't this idea of stopping breathing like four times within the hour, but that's something I would have never thought to ask my sleep doctor about if not for the watch tracking it every night. Yeah, really helpful. Thank you. Excellent. Hi, this is a question for Dr. Rai. For KLS patients, when you take spinal fluid, are the orexin levels being checked for them as well? Yep. And have you found that they were deficient in orexin? So, uh, I think everybody that's done it, including us, right? The short answer is no. Uh, the longer answer is that in the few patients uh, where it's been done several times, like, you know, in and out of a spell or even randomly, there are, it seems to be some fluctuations, but those, you know, how many people, uh, how many patients are willing to do multiple spinal taps and, and how many investigators are prepared to measure them is a real issue. Likely, I must say, that this group, or my patients, or I'm extraordinarily, the community should be um, grateful. I am, certainly, I just wish we could get more, but that's, we have one person who's done seven. We have five or six people that have been done four times. Uh, I think in total we probably have a dozen or 15 that have done two. So multiple, I think, gives us a much a better idea of what are the factors that are, if we're t carefully looking at what's going on at that time with medicine and other symptoms and et cetera, what might be accounting for those t differences. There's very little difference, for example, across time of day or night and things like hypocretin. That's known. We've done it in monkeys, rhesus monkeys. Uh, so hopefully now that I'm going to be in preferment, uh, meaning closer to retirement and doing things I want to do, which are get to these really interesting questions, is which ones are the most, would be most illuminating given the, you know, I am not getting younger, right? That, um, mm. what would those be? Um, and, and so I think there's opportunities. I think, uh, there, and, yeah, there's a lot of ways to do that. And is, is this something that you also need control subjects for? Yeah, controls are great, but, you So know, supporters. <laughs> well, that's one way, but there's, there's simple experiments. So, okay, I'll, I'll just tell you one really quick. 
because there's other things you want to talk about. For example, some people come in the hospital that have an aortic aneurysm, okay, and otherwise are fairly healthy in their 50s or 60s. So some Bob Dole had one, right, when he was saved years ago. But anyways, if you're 50 or 60, so in many of those patients, they will put a lumbar drain in the patient for 48 or 72 hours after repair of the abdominal aneurysm to decrease pressure on the blood flow and blood exit from the spinal cord. They're in the hospital. You can go in there and collect a sample on an hour. You just need somebody to do it. <laughs> Right, it's not, it's not brain, you know, I mean, it's a, it would be so illuminating, right? Because who wants to have 24 lumbar punctures at every hour across the, you know, it's just not gonna happen. Can I ask a question? When an individual is brought into the ER presenting crazy symptoms, for instance, my son who has a lumbar puncture on him, No, they just look for things that are treatable, that are going to hurt them and maybe end up with some bad outcome. And they'll only keep them typically frozen in the hospital lab for a week, <laughs> roughly. And unless you're sort of, you know, have depression, it's also to get enough volume. So it's, it's kind of problematic. It's better to do in a prospective controlled fashion. And my point is there are patients that come in for procedures to get these lumbar drains that are like, I mean, otherwise the nurses collect the fluid and it goes in the garbage. I mean, that, I mean if you're like Eastern European background, like where my parents are from, and you know, depression shield, I mean, that's a waste. <laughs> I won't throw plastic spoons away, okay? Um. Look, you got to have somebody with feet on the ground who has it as their project and intention and passion. That's how we did it when we were medical students or fellows or trainees. That's how it worked. Alex Aranza, when the first papers came out, he, he did a sabbatical with me from Spain. The first papers on sleep apnea after stroke were his. And you know what he did? He wheeled the patients from the emergency room into, after they got their stroke thing into the sleep lab in Barcelona. I mean, if you don't have it, it's feet on the ground. And, you know, the support of those people that are willing to do that. That's all I can say. Uh, the other way is forget it. <laughs> Ain't gonna happen. Um, for the online folks, I'm just going to repeat her two questions she asked um, when she didn't have the mic. Uh, the first was, oh, sorry. Um, and this isn't really for the panel, this is for the folks online. Um, her first question was, you know, if someone goes into emergency care and gets a spinal tap, do they test for those expanded questions? And Dr. Rye answered that one. And then the other one was, um, uh, now I'm having brain fog myself. Oh, how do we get that, that kind of passive collection to happen more actively? And Dr. Wright also answered that one. So. Yeah, I, I, believe me, when I was still allowed in the hospital, right, before we, the, <laughs> yeah. but before we went, and, and that's not, I don't think, a reflection on me. This is the, the move to hospitalists, right? I think we all uh, know what that is, right? Uh, so when that happened, all the subspecialists and, and most of the academics were, poof, out of academic hospital, okay? So uh, it, at the time, I would occasionally, I, I did, literally, you won't, may, some may believe this, some not, and I used to have the office next to the hospital. I slept in my office one night and went and got spinal fluid every three hours wow. from, from a patient in the five ICU on the cardiology service after an abdominal aortic aneurysm. So, you know, I wish I could say our residents and fellows had the same intellectual curiosity, you know? Some do, but I don't know, it might just be my background. Maybe I'm just getting to be curmudgeonly. <laughs> Not motivated. Um, just as a preface to my actual question, this business about testing a Rex and is it possible, and I wish I had asked before, that it isn't actually the orexin levels, but the, the, uh, the receptors 
and, and, and the whole thing about the agonists that makes the orexin work. So maybe orexin levels don't actually mean anything. It's the operation of the, yep. the receptors. Right, but yeah, you can't measure receptors very well, but certainly. Yeah, yeah you can't. But you can, abs you know, one of the, you know, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And mm -hmm. so until we look at that question, hard to know how to, how mm -hmm. to just mm -hmm. say not do it. Um, I got my uh, sleep study, which you know, somebody else up here said uh, they didn't tell me. You know, I don't know if this was true. They didn't tell me. Well, they don't tell you a lot in, yeah. in sleep studies, and I don't know why. It's one of the least communicative uh, treatment processes that I've ever participated in, and maybe it's because a tech does it and the doctor's not there, and you have to wait three months to see the doctor <laughs> after the sleep study was done, and yada, yada, wow. yada. But my question is, when I finally looked at the paperwork, I see... I have a 49% sleep efficiency. I don't know what that means. And I, and I wonder what we can learn from that, that sleep yeah, yeah, efficiency yeah. number. Yeah. Well, do you guys mind? No, go right ahead. Go. Well, there's, there's a lot of issues uh, that you brought up. And I don't want to get too granular. First issue is if you do have sleep apnea, right, and it's severe enough, you are going to get a diagnosis and treatment at many places within 48 hours. And one of the issues I see with these disorders, you just hit. You get a diagnosis and an MSLT, and then, of course, oh, you're very, very sleepy. You shouldn't drive home, but you drive home. Exactly right. And, <laughs> and then you don't have a follow-up for four months, mm -hmm. and you're unmedicated. And yeah. I think that's a big, I mean, you know, I've been sitting around for a year, you know, with people hitting me with sticks and no carrots. The big picture to me seems to move the field forward. That should be one of the top, right? We have to figure out clinical pathways that are feasible, practical within the constructs of what goes on right now to expedite diagnosis and treatment, right? Yeah. A. Sleep efficiency, unfortunately, is measured by the time they turn the lights off and tell you to go to sleep. And if you're awake for two hours, that gets counted as part of your sleep period. And ergo, sleep efficiency is, could be just all due to the fact that it took you two hours to fall asleep. Okay? So I, when I do interpretations, like I did two yesterday morning before I jumped in the car and wrote six prescriptions and tried to answer power chart and <laughs> da 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 and got here at 11 driving, um, that I, a thing that some people calculate not enough is sleep maintenance efficiency. In other words, once you do fall asleep, how good are you at staying asleep? And that I put in reports. And I also, like the person I did yesterday, I calculate that for all of their naps. So this one person I did yesterday morning, her sleep maintenance efficiency on four naps, so it was short, it was like six minutes, two REM onsets. Her sleep maintenance efficiency was 98.8% on her naps. So when Dr. Trotty and the field talk about sleepability, you know, there's something that hasn't really been looked at. There's probably a lot of things in just normal sleep data that nobody's ever looked at. And everybody has their own way that they want to do it. And sure, there's standards and consensus and best practices. Best practices and Hi, I don't know who to direct this to, but from your perspective, what would you say are the pros and cons of having the word idiopathic in front of hypersomnia to define <laughs> idiopathic hypersomnia? And what are we waiting for to drop the idi idiopathic, and whose job is it to determine when that moment will be? Wow. <laughs> all right, who wants to take that one? <laughs> I don't think, I think there's a benefit. I think you've all got an answer to it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think, I, I have not seen a benefit yeah. for it. For me, it almost made me 
um, feel like I had an invisible disease and I received an invisible diagnosis. Yeah. Um, it's, it doesn't, it almost hurt. <laughs> Yeah. It, when I try to go home and explain it to my family and friends, mm. it, you know, it, it, as soon as I hear idiopathic, oh, so you still don't know. Yeah. So anything after idiopathic seemed to just go mm -hmm. right, right through. So for me, it's, uh, it's not a great word. Right. Yeah. For, for me, it led me to question everything, right? My diagnosis came when I was 19. That was my first time, you know, being on my own. I was trying to, you know, I was away at college trying to figure out, you know, what to do, <laughs> what's going on with me, why, you know, why am I having these spells in the middle of class, something, you know, this experience. And when I received the diagnosis, I was just like, okay, this isn't a real answer. Like, I need more tests. Like, there's something else going, because basically you just told me this is happening and we don't know why. So there's a reason why, you just don't know it, right? So we need to yep. do more to figure it out. And it took, it, what it caused me to do was, I, I took the treatment because it helped, right? <laughs> you know, the medication helped me to be able to live a somewhat normal, you know, existence, to be able to get through school and I think one of, the, one of the, you know, separate from the, what we've heard is that it implies that it's one thing. And yeah. I think that's a big problem. That's probably the biggest problem, right? Because you're assuming by one label, it's one thing. And as I already said, yeah, I mean, I was stupid and got caught in that trap too, right? When we started the whole sleepy juice thing, right? It seemed like, oh yeah, this will be a piece of cake, right? <laughs> no, no. You know, the, the, the DSM-5, right? That's the International Classifications of Sleep Disorders, but DSM-5 calls it major somnolence disorder, I believe. So it has a different code and a different name. And it doesn't say idiopathic. Now, psychiatry is sort of on the fringes of sleep. I wouldn't say fringe, whoever's listening up there. Don't, <laughs> I, I'm trying to be very careful um, more than usual, because it's, uh, you, know, um, you know, and then it gets into this whole thing, you know, that's very important, I think, that uh, McCusick, uh, talked about is this whole issue of lumping or splitting, right? Do you lump? A geneticist likes to split, you know, then there's lumpers. And that was the idea behind the name and the organization in the first place, sitting in my living room 10 years ago. We had a long argument, hypersomnolence, hypersomnia. I mean, words matter, right? Yes. So I, I get it, and I'm very, very sensitive to it. Uh, I think Diane has, has already exposed me somewhere on YouTube, apparently. <laughs> Some narcolepsy meeting once going like batshit crazy talking about this naming it's issue. It's what's in a name on what's YouTube. What's in a name? It's on the Hypersomnia Foundation YouTube Right, channel. anyways, Thank yes, you, not, to, not to, for no shameless self-promotion. <laughs> right. um, it's good. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's why I'd rather just stick personally with symptoms and try to quantify the symptom or a group of symptoms rather than attaching anything. But, you know, insurance companies need it and, yeah. you know, Collective I, you know I don't know how you're going to get, until we find a biological yeah. cause, at least in a subgroup, look how long it took them to split narcolepsy into one and two. Yeah. Even though they knew, we knew about it in 2000. It didn't get codified until 07 or 08 in the ICSD-3. So even if we made some dramatic discovery trying to get doctors or insurance companies or anybody to change, it's still going to take 10 years, probably. Now, I'll add, putting my public policy advocate hat on, that one of the benefits in terms of being able to push for the federal government to appropriate more funding to NIH and some of the other um, agencies under the Department of Health and Human Services, looking at it from the symptom perspective allows us to better fit what we experience into some of the larger packages. For instance, and I made this argument to the fibromyalgia network, they didn't listen to me, and I'm just gonna say that <laughs> MECFS is getting a lot more freaking funding right now than Ooh. fibromyalgia is Ooh. when it comes to 
No, which is getting more fun? MECFS. Oh, uh, right, right. Yeah. Chronic well, fatigue there's, there's other reasons for that. There's other reasons, too. <laughs> and very they were strategic. Politi very political. Very political. That's yeah. my point. That's uh -huh. what I'm talking about is the, the politics, Careful with right? the pointing. But, <laughs> <laughs> but what I mean is with long COVID, this is the example that I'm giving, right? In politics, everything is situational and around what's urgent, right? There are a lot of issues that we know any given day is more urgent than what Congress is focusing on. But what's playing out in the media and what's playing out in society as a whole matters deeply in terms of what moves up to the top of what the Speaker of the House and the Senate Majority Leader is going to actually call to the floor and, and assign out to committees to move through. Yeah. Right. So when you have the president of the United States and these leaders say, we've got to figure out what's going on with long COVID. Let's let's uh, appropriate billions of dollars to the recover initiative to try to figure out what's beneath it. One of the key symptoms that they've identified globally is fatigue. Right. They're using the term fatigue around it. Yeah. What would be strategic for us is not to drop hypersomnia, but make the clear link yeah. between symptoms and, and going to the point around the spectrum yep. and looking at you know what multiple causes are, yes. inserting ourselves into the conversation and, and in the debate. We see some of the sleep apnea folks doing that around heart health and cardiovascular stuff, but there's so much we can do and the time might be running out because of the end of the kind of emergency so like moment the, that we're in. The brain in. fog that I had. Brain has. fog, exactly. Hey, I Sleep we inertia, have, yeah. exactly. Going in, tying it in. If you right. go to regulations.gov any given day, there's an opportunity for everyday people in addition to experts to go in and let the government know how we need to be directing um, funding around different programs. You know, laws are passed, they're general and broad. The administration and these agencies color it in, right, yeah. with, with how it's actually going to be directed and where the money goes. And that can be shifted and changed and does so in the rulemaking process, which happens through regulations.gov. I'm saying it again because <laughs> I really want more people to pay attention because folks think that laws are only made policy is only made through Congress with the president signing it into law. Regulatory policy is where you're able to really better define and shape how those laws are going to be implemented, including how money is funded. And, and so going that symptoms approach is a way, especially with brain fog, um, sleep spells, um, and some of the other symptoms related to hypersomnia could be a way for us to get in. MECFS has been doing it a lot along the long COVID funding, not only in the U.S., but really well, actually, in the United Kingdom. They're the model that I've been, really been looking at. Right. They've been, you know, really working to make sure that money goes to whenever they say long COVID, they say, nope, you've got to also add other viral onset disorders like MECFS. Yeah. The loop, the Lyme folks got in on it. Fibromyalgia okay. folks were like, no, we want our discrete funding just for fibromyalgia. And I'm like, y'all are missing the political moment here. They don't see fibromyalgia as urgent. They see these symptoms around long COVID as urgent. It's, and they're tying it together. It's actually more than symptoms. It's the effect of the symptom on the patient. Exactly. They're looking at the symptom burden. The outcome. And, and this is what the FDA is now shifting its focus towards. And, you know, I think that's a very good thing. Mm -hmm. um, just parenthetically, for the term idiopathic, I will never forget the first day of medical school, my dean um, addressed our medical class and he asked this very complex question. Does anybody know what the term idiopathic means? And so all the medical students, to show how brilliant they were, shot their hands up and said, it's a disease for which we do not know the cause. And the dean said, that's a very minor part of it. He said, the actual definition is idiot for the doctor and pathetic for the patient. <laughs> So I carried that with me now for 55 years. Um, but I just want to say one thing about um, what David said. The continuum and the status of the um, ICSD classifications, I think uh, you may or not, may not know this, but the uh, ICSD-3 TR uh, volume just was published. It's available at APSS now. 
And um, the difference between the original, which came out in 2014, and this one is minimal. And what David said, I think, is very important to know, that for us to come up with a classification system that is more than just symptoms, but hopefully will come out with certain degree of uh, pathophysiology is critical for funding for more research and for um, insurance companies to pay for treatments. So the idea of changing classifications of diseases like narcolepsy, NT1, NT2, and IH. And now the Europeans are talking about excessive need for sleep <laughs> as opposed to excessive daytime sleep. <laughs> now, <laughs> you know, this is a change in the classification that they are proposing. The ICSD uh, APSS has chosen not to go along with that. And um, I think that there's going to be some very important conversations over the next five to ten years about these classifications, and I think they're absolutely necessary. Great question. Can I can I comment on Victoria's thing? Because I think I, mean, I totally agree with what you said. Couldn't agree more. I mean, I'm just getting to the sort of political piece of this. Uh, to comment. So, in terms of how you strategize around that, yeah. kind of difficult. Yeah. Right? Because um, we did try doing that once when they had the big push for myalgia, whatever they were calling it at that mm -hmm. time, chronic fatigue syndrome. And we published a paper on the overlap of IH and chronic fatigue, right? And so, you know, we were to put a grant in, right? But the other side of it is many of those proposals and requests are written by people who they're meant to be written for. And ergo, the funding is already sort of earmarked for all the usual suspects. I, in that instance, I got involved in email conversations and did see by mistake on CC comments like, well, why, did, why is Emory doing this? They don't know what they're doing. They've never studied chronic fatigue, even though we did do a study with the CDC in Wichita with Bill Reeves, who ran mm -hmm. the whole damn program. <laughs> and it was like, well, Dr. Rye doesn't know anything in some of these emails. So there's that piece, too. Many of these requests that are coming out of the NIH are already written by the people they're meant to fund. That's one of, that, it, that's true. I know that's it's true. That's why the comments true. are so I've important. It. I've been on both ends of it. I've been on both ends of it. read it. The other, the other yeah, issue, I, I was trying to get to this issue with, oh, the other issue you have to be also very careful with is the better you define it, the better you'll be able to measure prevalent. And for pharmaceutical companies, I remember Dr. Trotty years ago saying, we got to write this paper up on the prevalence in the Embry undergraduate community because we had all the insurance, we had the, mm -hmm. we had the denominator and the numerator, and it was, took it beyond a rare disease. And so that you don't want to do that either because if it's beyond a rare disease, all of a sudden pharma then goes, they're, they're in the middle. Now you've moved them from, oh, I've got all these special dispensations mm -hmm. for a rare disease with no treatment to Lily right over here, okay, research labs is dealing with drugs with billions of people. You move it from rare to sort of like, mm, eh, kind of common. Ooh, that may not be so good, right, in terms of all the, so it's, there's so many factors, right? And, and unfortunately, what comes out of it, I think, is not any single entity or person can control or figure out which one of those, each one is going to be the critical one that pushes the button, right? The tilt, the tilting point. And it's, I believe me, I've sat up late at night, like not sleeping, <laughs> and it's not usually something I have a problem with <laughs> about these things. And you're going, damn. <laughs> Too many variables. It's like a Rubik's cube. Yeah. yeah.
Hello, I have two questions. First, I do wanna let everyone know there's a ring that's called an aura ring, O-U-R-A. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very important. It's better than our Samsung. Okay, Samsung. And the Apple, but it's a ring that you will wear that will give you a little bit more accurate reading. Um, and my son wears it all the time. You can sleep with it. And so it is, and it's kind of cute, but um, <laughs> it is something you might want to look at. But I have two questions. So my son um, has zero hypocretin. Um, so in your testing, have you tested on all of these new drugs, someone who has zero hypocretin, <laughs> and what the effects of some of the new medicines would do, because he is no hypocretin. Will any of these new medicines help him because it's generating, you know, how that works out? And my other question is, can anyone have a spinal tap? Can anyone request to know what their hypocretin level is? Is that readily available to anyone? Because my, I am a part of the DFW narcolepsy group and I will tell you that most of my group would rather go through the pain of having a spinal tap than wait four years to find out All what right. they have. So I'm going to answer that one first. And then the second one will answer. Uh, it's already gone because I'm <laughs> brain Swiss cheese. Um, so the first one is, <laughs> I mean, is there a practical reason? No, but I'd say that neurologists are really the only ones that are comfortable doing it, I think, as opposed to pulmonary and sleep, right, which are 80-some percent of the field. Uh, we do them all the time. So I have no problem doing it. The only commercially available lab is at Mayo. They charge a good amount. Uh, we do it on a research basis. Emmanuel, I, uh, Dr. Mignot had done it for many years, I think, as yes. a gratis, but there was a little quid pro quo, like, give me all your data and I'll do your spinal fluid, yes. you know, give me the clinical information yes. on the patient, which is a great model, actually. I said, God darn, I should have thought of that. <laughs> I'll measure anything you want, just give me pages on it. Yeah. <laughs> you collect all the data and I'll do yeah. that. So, um, so what we had done in the past for a long time is we just said, here's uh, an online web thing for Emory. Because we tried to go through the process of billing for it. And after about Dr. Trotney and I spent, I don't know, four or five days with administrators. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was mm -hmm. like, forget it. It's not, it's, it's not worth it, right? Because mm -hmm. to, to charge for it, you got to be CLIA certified. Mayo, Mayo has all the people that can right. do that, right? So if you want to do it that way, you can do it. Um, so you have to go to the Mayo Clinic? No, 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 no. We do other tests where we tap patients and get spinal fluid. Mayo does special tests for other things that we send off. The hospital lab ha would have that information. Mm -hmm. of how to handle and send to mail okay. and bill. Now, whether your insurance covers it, I don't know. Second point uh, about us is, we're, you know, I actually would be more than happy for us to do it because it's cheaper for us to do it in batch because you have to do 42 samples at a time. And oftentimes we'll only have five or six in three months. And it's very expensive to do them. It's one, it, one test at a time would be like two, $3,000, right? But if we batch them in 40, all I used to ask patients to do is go online to the Emory Healthcare thing, and instead of paying us, if you can, donate some money. <laughs> you can do it electronically through there, and it just goes into the research bucket. Now, I actually have put a needle in the back for several people who were at, in November or December who needed a diagnosis before the end of the year. <laughs> and getting them in the lab and getting an MSLT and all their deductibles, I said, you know, the fastest thing to do is just do this, and then you don't need an MSLT. It's actually cheaper. Mm -hmm. you know, what do you learn by that, right? All you really want is the nighttime test 
to make sure there are, you know, look at the other factors. How sleepy they are in the clinical context, it seems to me I get more info out of a needle and a spinal fluid. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm afraid we do need to close this session because there's a few minutes to transition downstairs to lunch. Um, and we will return here at one o'clock. But in the meantime, let us thank our panel for a very interesting time. Thank you.